in the gospel today we see this, the themes of sin and repentance and forgiveness and the mercy of God. These are ideas that are, of course, central to our spiritual lives. We all feel a sense of joy when we hear our Lord telling this poor man that his sins are forgiven. He was cured both in his body and in his soul that day. He got the full, the full package. What a complete transformation he, he had when he, when he walked out of that place. And we know that this man must have been sorry for his sins and that he was not attached to any mortal sin because if he were, our Lord would not have told him that he was forgiven. He certainly received even more than he had hoped for when he approached our Lord. And the reason the Jews reacted so strongly against our Lord's forgiveness of this man's sin is because for the entire history of man at this point, God had never endowed a human being with the power to forgive sin. The prophets of old had had the power to predict the future, to read the hearts of man, to heal the sick, and to raise the dead, and even in the case of Elias, to call down fire from heaven on his persecutors, not once but multiple times. But none of those holy men had ever had the power to forgive someone his sins. It seems clear in the story, though, that this man's main intention in in approaching our Lord was to ask for the healing of his body. And his being forgiven his sins seems like it was an unexpected benefit to him. But really, he should have come primarily to have his sins forgiven. Because sin is a far greater form of affliction than any bodily ailment. Even more so if we sin with a sense of presumption of God's mercy. If we presume on God's mercy when we sin, we have to remember what it says in Ecclesiasticus, which warns us, Say not, the mercy of the Lord is great. He will have mercy on the multitude of my sins. It says, for mercy and wrath quickly come from him, and his wrath looketh upon sinners. And the Psalms tell us something similar. It says in the Psalms, the countenance of the Lord is upon those who do evil, so that he might destroy even the memory of them from the face of the earth. This is what we can expect from God if we are obstinate in sin. Even our Lord himself, it says in St. Mark, it says, Looking around on them with anger, he was grieved for the blindness of their hearts. Our Lord was so patient and forbearing towards human weakness, but there was something that was repulsive to him, something that sickened his sacred heart and almost made him lose his divine tranquility. And this was people's obstinacy in sin, or their refusal to recognize their own sins so they would not repent. And our Lord gave terrible warnings against people like this. But what if we are sorry for our sins and we return to him with contrition and humility and fear of his justice? In that case, he will receive us with great mercy. He came to earth not to seek out some tiny number of holy people that had no sins or just to help a few hidden saints somewhere. No, he came in search of sinners. He said, I came not to call the just, but sinners to repentance. This is made clear also by our Lord's precursor, St. John the Baptist. In a sense, he was the last of the prophets who warned people that God was coming soon and that God's axe was put to the root of the tree, he said, St. John the Baptist said. And he said God was getting ready to purge the threshing floor and cast the chaff into unquenchable fire. He was warning the people 
of the chastisement of God for their sins to prepare them for the coming of Christ. And as soon as St. John the Baptist saw our Lord, the first words that he said were, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who taketh away the sin of the world. The subject of his sermon changed immediately and he spoke about God's mercy. <clears throat> if we read the Gospels, we see that no repentant sinner ever went to our Lord and was not received with immense joy. Today's Gospel gives us only one example of many. There was also the case of the woman who was caught in adultery, whom he protected from being stoned to death. And he didn't even give her some great penance to expiate her terrible sin. All he said was, Neither will I condemn thee. Go now and sin no more. And with that, she was off scot-free. She was forgiven. And we can imagine that she must have had immense gratitude to our Lord for the rest of her life. There was also St. Mary Magdalene who came and wept at our Lord's feet and the Pharisees criticized what she was doing. And our Lord defended her from, from their attacks. We see Zacchaeus, the publican, the swindler, whom our Lord went out of his way to meet as he was sitting up in a tree because that was the closest that he could get to our Lord because of the throngs of people. And our Lord joyfully accepted his invitation to eat lunch at his house that day. And Zacchaeus at that moment promised to return fourfold restitution to everyone that he had defrauded. And then there was the good thief. One of the last actions of our Lord's life was to pardon a criminal who was being executed for numerous heinous crimes. All the good thief had had to say to our Lord was to ask him to remember him when our Lord went into his kingdom. And our Lord responded by promising that that same day this terrible criminal would be in heaven, a favor that had been denied for thousands of years to the holiest men that ever lived. The good thief had to be a beatific vision that same day. Our Lord even asked for pardon for the people who didn't ask for it and didn't want it. As soon as he was raised on the cross, the first words out of his mouth were, Father, forgive them. Even as they were torturing him and blaspheming him and heaping insults upon him, he is asking for the forgiveness of their sins. We see our Lord's mercy even in the name that he chose to be called by in his earthly life. His name is Jesus, which means the Savior. And the angel Gabriel explained this to Our Lady. He said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And our Lord said to the Pharisees, I came to seek the sinful. It is not the healthy, but the sick who need a physician. And in order to save us from our sins, he had to suffer the most terrible torments and the most cruel death. He suffered every form of pain, both of mind and of body, that a human being can suffer, and to the greatest possible imaginable extent. And in order to further teach us the importance of mercy, he told St. Peter that he expected an equivalent amount of mercy from us. He told St. Peter, Thou shalt forgive thy brother, not seven times a day, but seventy times seven, so that we imitate also the riches of his mercy in our forgiveness of others. <clears throat> If we need any further proof of our Lord's mercy, we should read the 15th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel. It is called the Sinner's Chapter. We really have to absorb this passage. Our Lord is accused by the Pharisees who say 
This man con- converses with sinners and eats with them. And our Lord explains to them why he does this. He gives the parable of the lost sheep. He says a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off. And the shepherd leaves the ninety-nine in the pasture and goes out climbing over mountain ridges and through swamps to find the one sheep that was lost and bring him back. And our Lord, of course, is the shepherd in this story. He is the good shepherd. This is how he treats us. The 99 good sheep are safe and secure. He doesn't have to worry about them. But he has to find the one that needs his help and his attention. In the same chapter, he tells another similar parable about a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one. And she scours her whole house until she finds it. And then she has a great celebration and invites her neighbors to rejoice with her that she found that last coin. These images show us God's eagerness in pursuing those who are in sin. And his joy when we repent and his joy in forgiving us as he forgave the man in the gospel today. In fact, he told us that there is even more joy in heaven on one sinner who does penance than in 99 just who don't need penance. So if we are in sin, we should think about what a great joy we are depriving our Lord of and the holy angels by remaining obstinate. And how much love must our Lord have for us if all of heaven is so filled with joy when he gets one of us back. We don't celebrate recovering something unless it's something extremely valuable and precious to us. But our Lord's love for us explains why he has such great mercy towards us. And it also explains why he he punishes us so severely for sinning against him because we are rejecting such immense love. Let us meditate on the mercy of our Lord today and on his joy and eagerness in forgiving us, particularly when we fall into sin and then the devil usually tempts us to sin even more and wander even further away from Christ. That is his his old trick. But we should never give in to that. Instead, we should think about the great rejoicing in heaven that there will be when we repent and go to confession. Imagine what a party must be like in a place that is already filled with perfect happiness and complete joy. It is truly beyond human understanding, just as is also the mercy of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.